It's hard to believe that so many years have gone by so quickly. And uh, to be here in this house is such an awesome privilege. And um, it's just wonderful to see so many uh, friends. I nearly said old friends. And, um, but yeah, they are old friends. We're all getting a bit old, aren't we? Um, but it's lovely to see you and catch up with you and renew those friendships. And um, it's always a joy to, to come down here. Uh, it'll always be home. This church has been raised up, has been founded, raised up through the miraculous, through the miraculous power of God. And, and so I'd like to share this morning miracles of the past, the stepping stones of faith to a miraculous future. Uh, reading Deuteronomy 7.19 and Psalm 77 verse 11. And remember... And remember the miraculous signs and wonders and the amazing power God used when he brought you out of Egypt. The Lord, your God, will use this same power again and again and again. Psalm 77 verse 11. I recall, I remember, I recall all that you've done, O Lord. I remember the wonderful deeds of long ago. In relation to that verse, the commentary of the Life Application Bible says, you know, remembering the past, recalling the past, recalling how good God has been to you will strengthen your faith. And faith is so critical because it's faith that moves the mountains. Jesus said in Mark 11 verse 22, then Jesus said to the disciples, have faith in God. I assure you that you can say to this mountain, May God lift you up and throw you into the sea, and your command will be obeyed. All that's required is that you really believe and do not doubt in your heart. Listen to me. You can pray for anything, and if you believe, you will have it. You know, there's some wonderful stories from the founding of the Christian Family Center and on. Incredible stories of God's miracles. And those stories of God's miracles here told to the people of Murray Bridge, when Murray Bridge Christian Family Centre was commenced, those stories that were shared with those people in Murray Bridge created faith in their hearts, created an expectation. And through that expectation built, through the stories, through that faith, the Murray Bridge Christian Family Centre Church became a miraculous church which has moved mountains in the city of Murray Bridge. And look, the same is true for Blackwood Christian Family Centre Church. They're moving mountains. I went up there to preach um, earlier this year. And it's grown and there's just a wonderful church and they're impacting their area. The same is true for Alice Springs Christian Family Centre Church. They're moving mountains. I spoke to uh, um, Pastor Ben Matson this week and he said, Ray, we've had over 130 people three weeks, the last three weeks, three weeks straight. And I think it's 60, 70% are indigenous. It's a unique and amazing church. They're moving mountains there. Uh, the same is true for Lefevre Christian Family Centre Church. They're moving mountains. The same is true for Hobart, Hobart Christian Family Centre Church. They're moving mountains. Mountains in the prisons. Things are happening there that are just amazing. Now, what are the stepping stones to a miraculous future? being sent by God. Miracles occur when we are sent by God, when we're supernaturally sent. A couple of months after completing the CRC Bible College, um, I, I was asked, Ray, what are you going to do now? And I said, I don't know, but my heart surrendered to Jesus. Whatever he wants me to do, I will do. Uh, I'm just waiting to hear from him. And then shortly afterwards, I was woken up at three o'clock in the morning by the Lord. And I had this strong impression of a Bible verse. I had no idea what the verse was. And I, all I could hear was Isaiah 6, verse 8. Isaiah 6, verse 8. And I thought, I'm never going to get to sleep unless I open the Bible and read it. And it was the Lord saying to Isaiah, who will go for us? Who will we send? Who will go for us? And Isaiah said, Lord, send me, I'll go. And I said to the Lord, I said, Look, I don't know what this means, but wherever you send me, I'll go. And uh, 
uh, in the following months, uh, the Lord confirmed that scripture supernaturally, miraculously. Uh, I got a phone call asking me to go to the local church and uh, um, care for the Sunday school kids. And uh, I arrived at my old local church. I hadn't been there for a couple of years. My mum attended there. And uh, Robin and I went to spy out the land and because um, I felt God speak to me to say, look, you know, care for these kids. Care for these kids. They're not going to your church, but care for them. You know, and I could I sense God was arranging this. And uh, we sat down and there was a guest speaker, a minister, and he said, strange thing happened to me on the way to church this morning. He said, God told me that before I did anything, I was to read Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8. And I go, oh. And um, it wasn't long before um, they uh, said to me, um, after I did the Sunday school for a, some months, they said, we would like you to take over the youth group. But the youth group is located in a church in the district next to where you are, Flinders Park. And so... Uh, I, I knew that that was going to happen. So uh, I, um, again, went and spied out the land. Robin and I went along to this other church that the youth group was based in. And uh, the minister gets up and he goes, this morning I'm preaching on Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 to 8. And uh, I knew that I'd been called. And I knew that this was supernaturally miraculously confirmed and before long I found myself pastoring a group of 20 unsaved teenagers who all came to faith in Christ in a most miraculous way and out of that uh, uh, the Christian Family Centre Church uh, Seton was born. Uh, two years later uh, God spoke to me and also spoke to Pastor Bill Vasilakis and uh, God spoke to me to invite Bill to be the lead pastor of Christian Family Centre Church. Uh, I didn't have the leadership skills at that time and I needed to serve under a gifted leader and little did I know that that was preparing me to go to Murray Bridge and uh, lead that uh, first outreach Christian Family Centre Church. So God spoke to me to invite Bill. God had already spoken to Bill to pastor a church in the Western Districts. So when I walked into Bill's office and said, look, God's in, called me, God's told me to invite you. Bill nearly dropped off his seat. And um, yeah, it was the, the call in Bill's heart was confirmed. And of course, Pastor Bill was a sent man. He was sent by God. And God's sent leader led this church into just an amazing, miraculous blessings and miracles that occurred here and continue to occur this, uh, to this day. Fifteen years later, for 15 years I served under Bill here uh, on the team. And then 15 years later, Bill Vasilakis was driving through Murray Bridge on the way home from a national conference in Melbourne. <coughs> and God spoke to him about planting a church in Murray Bridge. And God spoke to Bill to send me. So I was sent again. And it was a supernatural sending because the Lord made it very, very clear through miraculous provisions um, and, and miracles again. It was a supernatural sending. Of all places to start a church, we started a church in the funeral parlor of Murray Bridge, the dead center of town. <clears throat> and after about six months of preaching and praying for the power and presence to come on the church, God turned up one Sunday morning and miracles of healing happened and power, presence came on the church through signs and wonders and all these signs and wonders and miracles and people came from all over the place to experience God. Yes, the spiritually dead were being raised to life in the funeral parlor. Secondly, calling. Miracles, are call, uh, miracles occur through the callings of God. As I look back, I see that to have a miraculous church that moves mountains, it's necessary to have people with spiritual callings in their lives. 
the callings of saints, the callings of prophets, the callings of pastors, and the calling of kings. And all of you here have callings. You may be called as a king, a leader, a leader of a department maybe. Uh, you may be called uh, as with the gifting of pastor, you know, to care for people and love people. We're all called as saints to be separated into lives of service, serving God with pure and holy hearts. And, um, yeah, prophets, speaking prophetically, supernaturally. So first of all, saints, to build the Christian Family Centre Church at Seton, God provided a team of saints. He sent saints. Saints are people who, through their love for God, separate themselves from, from their old lives of sin and selfishness to serve God and people in holiness. And saints are recognized by their sacrificial living and their purity and honesty of hearts. And my goodness, the Seton Christian Family Centre Church have been a sacrificial serving people um, from the very day that this church commenced. It's been wonderful, wonderful testimony. And then prophets. Uh, to build this Christian Family Centre Church, God sent prophets. He sent men and women who would hear his voice and speak supernaturally to guide the church, protect the church, encourage the church, to bring healing and release to precious people by speaking encouraging words, words of revelation, words of God's love about things in their lives that only God could know. And that has been wonderful. And then pastors, to build this Christian Family Centre Church, God sent pastors. Pastors are caregivers and encouragers and intercessory prayers. Best described by Jesus' words, Peter, do you really love me? Feed my lambs. Peter, do you really, really love me? Yes, Lord. Then, you know, I'll oh, feed my sheep. And then he says, Peter, do you really, 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 really love me? And Peter says, yes, Lord, of course I do. And Jesus said, feed my little lambs. You know, feed them, care for them, treat them tenderly. And um, this describes loving and la loving people, laying down one's life for the flock, precious people. So true shepherds lay down their lives for the sheep. And love for people is a revelation or a revealing of a pastor's heart. And that kind of love will infiltrate and saturate a church. And love is the greatest drawing factor in a church and few people can resist it. And lastly, kings. To build this Christian family centered church, God gave kings. He gave people with leadership gifting to lead all the various departments. And uh, kings are leaders and visionaries and motivators and organizers. And this morning we heard announced about the kids uh, group that you're starting and uh, one of your young women, Shay. Shay, I mean, she's a king. You know, she, she's been called to lead and. Uh, uh, see visions and motivate and uh, inspire. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to hearing great reports uh, of what uh, is going to happen. So God sent, God called, and God built the Christian Family Center churches through teamwork. Teams made up of kings, prophets, priests, and pastors. And that brings me to the next step of uh, the stepping stone to stepping stones of uh, a miraculous future, and that is teamwork. We naturally go to teamwork. It's Teamwork is a stepping stone to a miraculous future. So the Lord builds his church through teamwork, through you. Every great leader needs a great team. And the formation of this miraculous church commenced with a team of men and women who had the call of saint on their lives. Their hearts were separated from the world to Christ to serve Jesus and his church sacrificially. You know, the board of the first board of the Christian Family Centre Church were under 20 years of age. And most of you would know the board members, Pastor Philip Bryce and Janet Bryce and Pastor Steve West and Marilyn West and uh, Ross Auden, of course. And I can say without hesitation or exaggeration, that the success of our Christian Family Centre churches has been as a result of teamwork through great and gifted men and women that God raised up. Men and women with a spiritual passion and a heart of obedience and faith manifested in a purity of lifestyle. 
And then we come to point four, and that is, this is another stepping stone to a miraculous future, and that is presence and power. There is nothing like the presence and the power of God, His Holy Spirit, to establish a miraculous church that moves mountains. With Seton Christian Family Centre Church, the first manifestation of the presence of God occurred with a closing prayer at the end of a Bible study. I decided to run a Bible study for these uh, 20 or so wild young people who came to youth group, but they didn't know Christ. They just came to the youth group for social time. And so I, I announced this Bible study. And on this Friday night, I put out four chairs in that Philip Bryce, on his first night, received Christ. He came to the youth group, and on the very first night after I preached about Jesus, he gave his heart to Jesus. So he was my number one team man, number two, Robin's number one team woman. <laughs> and, um, and then shortly after that, uh, Neil Edwards um, uh, came to Christ. So we, there were four of us. And so for this Bible study, I put out four chairs. And I went to the toilet, and I came back, and my wife had found every chair in the house, about 20 of them. And she put them in the lounge. And I said, what are you doing? And she said, well, I'm putting out chairs for the Bible study. I said, don't be stupid. There's only four of us. You know, there's only going to be four of us. And very cheekily, she said, where's your faith? I said, smarty pants. And I went and put all the chairs back, all through the house. It took me about 10 minutes. Anyway, we started the Bible study, the four of us, at around 7.30. And... At 7.35, I looked across at Robin and I said, see, smarty pants. And I opened the study and I'll never forget that little book. It was called Jesus Christ School of Discipleship. And the first study was on John 3.16, for God so loved the world, he gave his only son. And the study was all around that. At about 7.40, the front doorbell went. I went to the door, opened it, and in came 20 teenagers. <laughs> Guess what? I had to go and get all those chairs again and eat humble pie. But anyway, throughout this Bible study, none of them were Christians. They were rat bags. I mean, they was, some of them were semi-street kids, and, and um, yeah, they, were, they were a wild bunch. Philip was the only person who was sort of, you know, semi-sanctified and... Um, <laughs> In those days, he used to wear these coloured beads around his neck. and <laughs> My goodness, he, he was very cool, Philip was. Um, I shouldn't tell his story, should I, Philip? Um, anyway, uh, th they were just um, out of order. They were, they were out of control. I, I got very disheartened. In fact, I got broken hearted. And um, I, I just said to Philip, Philip, um, would you close in prayer and then, you know, I'll, I'll close after you. And they were just laughing, and Philip's praying this fantastic prayer, and they're on, you know, poking each other and going, laughing at Philip, and you know, calling him a dork, and and all those sorts of things. <laughs> and that's a word from way back. Um, you probably haven't heard that word, um, but anyway, again, I was just broken-hearted, and anyway, I, I closed my eyes, and I just said, Father God, Father. That's all I got out, and I could hear bang, bang, bang. And I could hear crying, and then I could hear voices. And like I was almost too scared to open my eyes. And I looked up, and there were teenagers falling off their chairs, frontwards, bang onto the floor, with their faces in their hands, you know, crying out, God, forgive me. Others slid off the lounge chairs on their, on their backs onto the floor. And hands in the air saying, Jesus, I worship you. I love you. Forgive me. Jesus, come into my life. And, and, and the others are in tears and they're, they're falling, they're praising, they're crashing on the ground. Uh, and and I, I didn't know what to do. I, initially, I thought that they were having me on. I, I thought, you know, they're putting on a show. They're, they're really making a mockery of me and um, really trying to give me a hard time. But, but I observed that the tears were real. I observed 
you know, the presence of God just transforming their faces. It's like they, their faces began to glow and the, the light was reflecting off the tears that were running down their cheeks. And, and I'd never seen anything like it before in my life as a Christian. And actually, I've never seen anything quite like it after. Uh, but uh, that was the commencement of really of the Christian Family Center Church. And, you know, week after week, we would run a Bible study. We'd start at 7.30 with prayer and we'd go to do the Bible study at, uh, go to do the Bible study and, and we'd look at the clock and it was 10 o'clock. You know, we'd been lost. You know, everyone was just lost in praise and worship for hours. And it was just like time went, uh, like grease lightning. I remember one night, they were all praying and, and, and worshiping God and some of you may remember Derek Smith. And Derek, came into that group and he was resisting God. He was into lob saying ramp of the third eye and you know spiritism and stuff like that. And it got too hot for him because all his friends were getting saved. So he took off and he joined the army. Anyway, we were all broken hearted that Derek had joined the army because we knew that he was trying to escape the call of God. And so this particular night, we were praying for Derek and we we're praying, Jesus, you know, go to Derek. And we prayed, Jesus, he's into the demonic realm. Open his blind eyes, open his spiritual eyes to show him those demons that are around him, who follow him, who are, are leading him into deception. Open his eyes to actually see the, the, the horrible, evil presences that he's handed his life over to. Anyway, we're actually praying this prayer. That, that are the words we were praying at that very moment. And the phone rings. And I pick up the phone and I say, hello? And I hear a voice at the other end. Ray, this is Derek. Help me. And I go, it's Derek. And they all go, it's Derek. And their arms go in the air and they shout, it's Derek. God, deliver Derek. And it was so loud I had to shut the door because I couldn't hear him. It was wild. Anyway, I say, what's happened? He goes, Ray, I, I was walking across the oval from, from, from the barracks. And he said, I sent something behind me. I looked behind me and there were these two ugly figures. I've never seen such ugly people, but they weren't people. You know, uh, they were evil spirits or something and I'm scared. What do I do? I said, Derek, call on the name of Jesus, repent of your sin and ask Jesus to forgive you for your wickedness and say in Jesus' name, get out of here now. I go, do it now. He go, and I hear him on the phone, you evil spirits. I, I give my heart and life to Jesus and you have to go. In Jesus' name, I tell you to get out of here. I said, what's happened? He says, they're gone. I said, well, you need to come home and live for Jesus. So he goes to his commander and he tells him this story. <laughs> the, the commander goes, you need help. We're releasing you from the army. <laughs> so Derek was home in a couple of days. I mean, that was amazing. True story, isn't it, Philip? True story. Philip and Janet, no, no. It was amazing. It was amazing. One, one guy, I mean, these were amazing prayer meetings. As I say, we start at 7.30 and they just go to 10, 10.30 at night. And on two occasions, two different guys came in. They were invited. They were friends of, you know, some of these kids, teenagers. And one, Tom Langberg. Uh, Tom walks into the middle of this prayer meeting and he just goes, whoomp, flat on his face, blood spurting out of his nose and he's holding his nose and goes, what happened to me? And I go, the Spirit of God's come on you. God's calling you to be his son. He loves you. And he's got a purpose for your life. Do you want to receive Jesus? Yes. And so we led him to Christ. And a couple of weeks later, this bike he came in, walked in the middle of the episode, bang, straight down. And um, uh, just an amazing time. You know, I told uh, our um, Murray Bridge Youth Young Adults pastor uh, that recently that he could have whatever he could believe for. And I told him this story. And I said, you can have whatever you believe for. And this story put a vision in his mind. You know, it created faith, a faith that could move mountains. And a couple of months ago, uh, we had a, a youth young adults camp. And there are a whole bunch of unchurched kids. I mean, Murray Bridge teenagers, I mean, they are wild. I mean, we've had the police there a couple of times this month. 
um, because there are some pretty wild, broken kids. Anyway, I had a large number, uh, probably well over 100 uh, teenagers, 130, 130 teenagers. Well, our youth, young adults, lead pastor went to that camp with expectation. He, you know, I told him these stories. I told him, what he, you can have this. You know, God will do the same acts of power again. He will do this again and again. God will do miracles again and again if you expect. And it created faith. And so here a couple of months ago, amongst these kids, the power of God fell on them. And, I mean, they're touching each other. The Spirit of God's coming on them. They're speaking in tongues. Forty of these teenagers were baptized in the Spirit, speaking in tongues. They were prophesying. They were speaking words of inspiration to each other that God was giving them for each other that they couldn't have known. The atmosphere was just miraculous. And our youth pastor came home and, and said to me, Ray, I have never seen anything like this in my life. He said, I have been preaching to youth groups all over the country. And uh, he's preaching in dozens of, of different churches all over Australia, uh, in all different denominations. He said, I have never seen anything like I saw this weekend. In Murray Bridge, the first manifestation of the Spirit of God occurred as I preached a sermon on the power of the Word of God. And um, I, I remember the sermon quite well. It was just, a, you know, like a five, six-point sermon. The power of, uh, sorry, the Word of God has power to save. The Word of God has power to heal. The Word of God has power to wash and so on. And I got to about the third point. And, um, you know, I wasn't telling any emotional stories or, um, you know, plucking people's heartstrings. I was just sort of like a teaching message on the power of the Word of God, the power of Jesus' Spirit. And um, uh, I looked up, and that morning we had an influx of visitors. There were drug dealers there, a couple of drug dealers, a couple of really notorious, really wicked men. And uh, I looked up and I saw this drug dealer who had, and he was a drug user, had this long hair that went right down um, his body. And uh, uh, I could see tears running out of his eyes. And I go, wow, this is a hard man. And then I look, and the whole church is crying, you know. And, and I'm just thinking, God has come. God's manifesting his presence. And so I stopped the service. I stopped preaching. I just said, God has come. The Holy Spirit, God is, the, we have a visitation. And so I, I'm, I'm closing the service and I'm giving an invitation for you to come forward and I would love to lay hands on you and pray for you and ask God to touch you in miraculous ways. And everyone, all the unchurched people, the non-Christians, the two drug dealer, drug addict guys, they all came down and knelt and I didn't tell them to kneel. And they all fell on their knees and just started praying and worshipping God. And from that week on, every week, week after week, the presence of God was manifest. And people were just overwhelmed. And it was an amazing time. And then um, um, following that experience, there was a healing flow manifested in the church. And, and every week there were amazing miracles. And, and the church doubled in 12 months. And great awe came on the people. Um, a little girl by the name of Katie, she had this long-standing uh, ear infection that she got overseas. And it, it was not responding to antibiotics. And a specialist, um, she saw a specialist who said, you have to have surgery, you have to clean this, this um, infection out of your ear through surgery. And um, so her parents brought her for prayer on the uh, Sunday. The surgery was on the Monday. She went and saw the specialist on the Monday and he said, well, I don't know what's going on, but it's gone. We don't have to do anything. It's, she's healed. An elderly man, Laurie Jarvis, had suffered from a sinus condition for 30 years. He had to daily use special nose drops, costing about 20 bucks a week. He came forward for prayer for his feet. And I don't know if his feet were healed, but while we were praying for his feet, his sinuses started to pop and crackle. And his sinuses cleared and he was able to breathe. And he goes, I can breathe. 
I can breathe. Something's happened. I can hear this noise in my head. And I can breathe. And he was instantly healed. And I said to him, now you're healed. That 20 bucks a week, you need to give that to the church. (laughs) But he was more than happy to do that. And uh, he was healed fully and permanently. And uh, it is just wonderful, wonderful story. Um, An unchurched girl, early 20s. uh, She was suffering from tuberculosis. And in Murray Bridge, about 10 people um, were infected by this very drug-resistant form of tuberculosis. So it was uh, a real worry there for a while. And they had to trace them all down and find them. And Anyway, she came along to church and, and she asked for prayer, for healing. And um, her name is Stephanie and um, we're still very good friends with her. But um, she, uh, she came for and I said, um, do you believe in Jesus? And she said, no. I said, do you believe that Jesus can heal you? And she goes, well, no, not really. I said, so why are you here? She said, I've heard some stories. I've heard stories of miracles happening here. And so I just thought to myself, I've got nothing to lose. Might as well give it a go. I go, fair enough. See, what she didn't realize is the stories of the miraculous had created faith, a subconscious faith in her mind. And so she submitted herself to God and his grace and his power. And even though she did not believe in Jesus or love him, she had a need. And so we laid hands on her and she just started crying out in pain. And she said, it's just like this fire is burning my lungs. See, the doctor had told her that she was not responding to the medication not only that that her lung was so badly infected they were going to have to remove her lung unless there was a dramatic change in the next two weeks and so she was pretty terrified and so you know here she is feeling this searing heat going through her body and um and i i I said in faith i said that's god healing you and i'm thinking i hope i'm right anyway She went back to the doctor and he just says, I don't know what's happened. You can come off your medication. That's the first good news. The second good news is your lung is totally healed. I don't understand it. And uh, I had the privilege then, both her and her um, partner uh, gave their lives to Christ and I had the privilege of marrying them. Oh, look, I could tell stories for hours but I'll give you one more a terminal um, cancer patient um, was uh, sent home to die with malignant liver cancer this was in October 1998 and uh, we went we were called this was a lady from another denomination but again she heard about the miracles of healing that were occurring in Christian Family Centre Church she, she, so she called us. So Robin, my wife, and I went to the Wakefield Hospital and uh, we spoke to her. She informed us of the diagnosis. Um, we've got a copy, a, a written copy of her diagnosis. And uh, she was advised that uh, there would be no chemo or radiotherapy because the prognosis was so poor. She was advised by the doctor to book herself into palliative care before leaving the hospital. But we prayed for her. She felt the power of God go through her body. And I remember clearly praying, God, stretch forth your hand and make it into a sieve. Let your hand be a sift. Stretch out your hand and sift every cancer cell out of her body and out of her liver. And... We went home, she went home the next day to die, and she didn't die. In fact, she got better. She got weller and weller. So she went back to the specialist, they examined her, they took scans and go, we can't explain this. There is only one word for what has happened to you, and that is miracle. And uh, this lady is still cancer-free 18 years later.
you know, sometimes we pray for old people and we think because they're old, God's not going to heal them. I'll tell you, this is the last story, I promise. This 80-year-old lady, same thing, cancer, you know, too far gone to do anything, sent home to die. Two of our elders, uh, one, of it, one pastor, one elder, board member, went and laid hands on her, prayed for her, and again, she was instantly healed. And she lived by herself uh, until 82 years of age and basically passed away uh, from the flu or, you know, old age, basically. Um, but had two wonderful years uh, with her family and, grand you know, with her kids and her grandkids. And um, again, a wonderful story. But look, let me say, when these... Oh, what time do I have to finish? I'm going longer than the first time. I can see I'm going to be in trouble. I thought I had plenty of time, but... Um, time's running away. But when these miracles occurred, the level of anticipation rose. And the desire to be a part of the kingdom growing team caused everyone to discover their callings, their giftings, as to whether they were kings, pastors, prophets. You know, um, they wanted to, to, to fulfill what God had for them to be a part of a great team to move great mountains in a, in, in a city, the city of Murray Bridge. That brings us to point five. Inspired anointing preaching. Preaching. Preaching is a stepping stone to a miraculous future. Faith preaching nearly always precedes the powerful presence of God. Preaching that proclaims Jesus Christ as Savior and, and raises him up as Lord. And to preach that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, Jesus came from heaven, God's Son, God born into human flesh, the perfect man, the perfect God, who could experience everything we experience, who was tempted like we are tempted, but never sinned. And then he gave for us his sinless body. He was a substitutionary sacrifice. We are bad. He is good. The Bible says that when he was nailed onto that tree, a legal act occurred and our badness was put into him and his goodness was put unto us and we were covered over by all of his goodness. We were hidden in his goodness so that when God looks at us, when we have received Christ as our Savior by faith, God looks at us and he sees perfection. He sees righteousness. He sees holiness. And we can approach God not with fear and inferiority and guilt of our weaknesses and fra frailties and sins, but knowing that we are covered over. And we have a saying in Murray Bridge, we don't deal with people on the basis of what they do, their actions, their behavior. We don't deal with people on the basis of their behavior. We deal with people, we look at people on the basis of their desires of their hearts, what they want to be. And some people for a little while struggle with their marijuana. Some people for a little while, you know, they struggle with their pornography. But we look at what their desires are. Some people just struggle for a while with their unforgiveness, their bitterness. You know, they hurt and they hate. But we go, what's your desire? What, what do you really want to be? And we tell them how to trust God. We tell them who God has made them in Jesus Christ. We tell them how much God loves them and his love heals them and transforms them. I'd love to tell a story about this broken woman but I'm, this just recently come into the church but I'm running out of time. Just unbelievable. Um, the, the life is just, her life is just beyond comprehension. Bikey girl. Um, oh, hear a story, make you cry. She's coming to the family centre. The people have just loved her and it's transformed her life. It's fantastic. And so, you know, we, we preach on God's love and what Jesus has done for precious people and it transforms them. See, God's inspired preaching opens up people's hearts to his healing and to the miraculous power. I'll just add in here because this morning's worship was fantastic. I'll add in here, inspiring worship and music 
prepares people's hearts also for the preaching of the gospel. And look, we have had so many people saved before the word has even been preached through the presence in during the worship times. They just walk in, burst into tears. I don't know what's happened to me. We tell them about Jesus. Take them into another room while the service is on. Tell them how Jesus died for them. Do you want to receive him? Yes. I want to receive Jesus. Worship is powerful. Uh, and lastly, purpose. A mission, an inspired vision. Shay has got a vision. She's got a picture. She's got a mission. You know, a, a mission, inspired vision from God, firmly fixed in our hearts, fixed in our, in, our, in our hearts and minds, releases God's power for miraculous future. You know, when we know what God wants us to do, when we know that God's speaking to us, has spoken to us, and he, we know who He wants us to reach, and when He speaks to us, and we know how He wants us to do it, the methods that He wants us to employ, you know, God's power. God's miraculous manifestations come where there is that sort of purpose, vision, faith vision. Jesus also gave the Murray Bridge Christian Family Centre Church a vision, number one vision, was to reach children and the teens of our city because there are so many teenagers, so many kids in Murray Bridge. It's a, it's a city of young people, but broken young people devastated, abused young people. And it just tore our hearts when we went there and we saw that. And no church, no church was reaching them. And so Jesus gave us a vision to reach them, to take them the message of God's love and healing power, to teach them to become fully devoted followers of Christ. And uh, all of our top leaders now are, are kids that were saved. Uh, and, you know, uh, Robin taught them to be preachers and worship leaders um, as, as little kids. You know, it wasn't Sunday school to keep them out of the way. It was training ground to raise up leaders. And this is what your kids' church will become. The resulting Murray Bridge Christian Family Centre Church today has approximately 800 people regularly attending, which is one out of 20, every 20 people in the town. Uh, that's, you know, that's, that's quite huge. But the church is also unique in that I reckon approximately 50% of the church attendees is children and teenagers. Would I be right, Robin? Yeah, about 50%. That's quite unusual. But the congregation is really quite amazing also, and it's, again, probably very much like this, that it's made up of wealthy businessmen, middle class, single mums, low socioeconomic um, people, poor people, indigenous families, um, Filipino families, Chinese families, what else we got? Oh, Japanese families, Korean families. Um, it's just amazing mix. And yet they all mix and relate as one unified family. In my home group, uh, we have 35 men, women and children. And I love our home group because we have a meal every Thursday night before the home group. And I get Japanese food. I get Indonesian food, I get Chinese food, I get Korean food, I get Maori food, I forgot the Maoris, I get Maori, I get this fantastic, I can't wait for Thursday night this week. You know, Murray Bridge Christian Family Centre Church has the largest kids work and youth group in the city and we estimate that thousands of people have attended some function of the Murray Bridge Christian Family Centre Church. So Murray Bridge CFC has moved mountains. It's the largest attended, most influential church in the city. And to Jesus Christ, be all the praise and the glory because he builds his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Our new young leaders now are just moving into the schools and running programs in the schools, just impacting the schools of Murray Bridge. And why? What, how, how? Why did all this happen? Because of the stories. The stories of the miraculous that occurred here in Seton. You see, I told the stories. I told the stories of the miraculous. I told the stories of the miracles. I told the stories of the callings. I told the stories of, of the visions fulfilled here of Seton Christian Family Centre Church. And that built expectation. You know, uh, uh, that, that 
um, gave them stepping stones for their future. And those stepping stones are the stepping stones of sending, the sending of God by dreams, visions, and prophecies. Good to hear um, Shay has been sent. And then the calling, the stepping stone of the calling of God as saints, living lives of purity, separated to God, living pure lives. And then the stepping stone of prophets, preachers, and teachers, as pastors and shepherds, as kings, as leaders. Teamwork, the presence and power of God, the preaching of Jesus for life change, at knowing purpose and vision, faith goals, and anticipating, expecting. That's a faith vision, expecting, anticipating. Believing God's word when he says, the power that he's revealed in the past, he wants to reveal again in the future. What he's done in the past, what does it say? You, the Lord, your God, will use this same power again. And it's anticipating that same power again. And so uh, my encouragement to you this morning is to lift the stories that I've told you of the beginning of Seton, the beginning of Murray Bridge, the, the things that are happening now in all of our churches. They are to lift your, your anticipation, to lift your vision, to lift your faith, so what are you anticipating for the future? Are you anticipating the discovery of your calling as king or pastor or prophet? Or maybe two or three of those. Um, have the stories that you've heard this morning of those past miracles inspired your faith level to, for you to reach out in anticipation to be used by God, to become a part of a team? I'm sure that Shay needs more people on her team. It's a huge task. And in our kids' church, we now have 150 kids in our kids' church every Friday night. And it is amazing. Can I tell another story? No, I'm running out of time. Maybe I will. Robin, you come and tell this story. Quick. The story about in the school holidays, the school. Yeah. Oh, we had a camp, just really quickly. We had a camp, and you've got to understand that these 130 kids, um, I have a little group of 10 six-year-old boys. One of the fathers is in prison. Another one lives with his dad not and his brother, his uncle, um, no mum in the family. These kids are broken. These kids are from abuse backgrounds, 150 of them, and we finished on uh, the middle of night so it'd be a two full day and we we're into the third day and uh, the leader was telling the story and he just said I really feel as if there's some kids here that need God to touch them need God to speak to them we've been talking about God speaking to us and how he loves to speak to us and so Jacob said I'm just going to kneel down the front here and if you want to come and kneel with me, come and kneel with me. And we started to sing this song, um, Your Love Sends Me to My Knees, Brings Me to My Knees. And the kids had been singing that all camp. And 130 of these kids, just I just felt like this wave that just went. And I was in the middle, sort of halfway back, trying to keep these 10 six-year-old boys still for two seconds. And... They just went to their knees. Every single kid went to their knees. It was absolutely amazing. And I'm just sitting, just bawling my eyes out, just like, oh, my goodness, this is God. And God visited those kids. Afterwards, there were stories about what God spoke to those kids, many of them, as I said, coming from really neglectful and abused backgrounds, but God spoke to them specific words.